Hello there, and welcome to my new video for Songs of Six version 66. Today I've got 10 tips and tricks for happy citizens for you. So I really hope that this will help you to get that happiness bar full and get some fresh immigrants whenever you need new workforce. So let's get right started with number one. I want to point out a couple of services that you can put into your cities that don't cost any workers. These are the best because at the end of the day, most of the time we are looking for new workers when we're trying to make our people happier. So here goes. Wills and hearths are accessible from the beginning of the game. They also save lives. They don't need anything besides the resources and a janitor to upkeep them. The wonderful thing about them is the wills save you from heat, uh, from dying from heat in the summer, whereas the hearth saves you from dying from cold in the winter. All you need there is a bit of timber, so make sure that these are filled. The other two services that you can go for are shrines. These are also unlocked right from the get-go at the beginning of the game and they provide a lot of happiness. And unlike the um, evil gods temples, if your civilization has some admiration for all four gods, feel free to drop down all the four shrines. Shrines don't require anything. They don't require sacrifice, they don't require workers, nothing. They're just free happiness and is well worth spreading out these three services wherever you go because this way well it's free workers basically just for a little bit of stone and wood it goes far away it goes a long way in building your city up now number two i want to lose a few words about placing services so first of all you want to spread the services about about a across the city as good as possible. So whenever you click anything that provides services, you get a nice sweet mesh grid that shows you the coverage of that service. So we see here the coverage of the wells, we see here the coverage of the hearths, and finally with version 66, my pleas have been heard, when I click one service building, you see the entire grid. To show you what you can do out of this information, I want to show you something where I have failed my city. So, the lavatory, we still have only one in the entire city, and when you now zoom out, you notice that there's quite some pressure in this city. People need another place to seek relief at. So this way you can find out where to place down a new service because they are entirely useless if you just grab them all into one place. No use in that. The other thing is when you go into the services tab here, you can find out how happy the people are with the current services. You can also take that as a measure to find out when a new copy of that service is necessary. There's only one thing that I want to point out here. Check out the upgrade level. So here, for example, on the stages, we have upgrade 47 person. That means until an upgrade on the stages has been made, the happiness of this service cannot go higher about this number. So some numbers are low because you are low tech. Some numbers are low because you need to build something new. So all in all, well, use it. I hope that the user interface one day will be a little bit less cryptic about that detail, but until then, now you know how to work around it and it shouldn't be that much of an issue now. So, next up, I want to talk about which services you want to research first. So, there's a couple of services that are dirt cheap and have a huge impact on your city. Namely, you can go for stages. These cost you only 100 tech points and you just need to build a stage for four workers and you get a huge payoff. Same goes for the proper burial tech. The graveyard increases the happiness of the city so tremendously. Again, just 100 tech points. It is really, really cheap. The other thing here I want to point out, Refined Tastes allows you to upgrade the food stalls only with pottery. Pottery is also something that you can easily import from your neighbors, and it also increases the happiness of your city tremendously, as food stalls are pretty much a common staple that every city will have very soon. The other upgrade that you see down here is taverns, but these are in my opinion, not worth it, because without booze, taverns don't do anything, so you don't need to unlock these. The other thing that I personally find extremely helpful is Bloodsport, as fight pits are, in version 66, extremely cheap. You don't need to import any costly weaponry anymore. You get a huge payoff for just 250 tech points. 
The rest of the stuff here is relatively costly to get some bang for your buck, and I don't recommend them too much. There is, though, a few more things. Here in the Architecture tab, check out the roads. Some species are crazy about roads, especially the fancy ones. You can also relatively cheaply upgrade your markets. Alright, 300 is already a little bit in the more costly area, but it is easily attainable in the mid-game. The upgrades of markets here again, just pottery very cheap and if you have the necessary cash to spend fancy hearths and sculpting are also really good and last but not least plumbing plumbing allows you to spread water relatively cheaply that is not really where i'm where i want to go towards to it leads though to bathing bathing is a powerhouse you just need to plot down bathhouses and all you need from that point on is pot uh, is coal to keep them warm there's not necessarily a freshwater access uh needed to get a lot of bang for your buck here again only 300 tech points and as an icing on the cake you also get a well upgrade that'll only cost you some clay it's also a resource that is very easily importable and very cheap and last but not least posh relief allows you to upgrade your lavatories the cut stone is a little bit of a cost factor but it goes really really into a powerful upgrade there can only recommend so Let's get on over to number four. I want to show you a little bit of thing that is important to note. When you go here and check out the description of that, there's a tab called expectations. This, I want to point out, is basically your, your death clock. Your city will grow more needy the larger it'll grow. So that means the people will expect more. So without doing anything for your city, when you keep growing your city, like procreation, babies and the like, your city will eventually degrade because the people will just expect more. Therefore, really try to keep those, uh, those happiness bars overfilled. That's the gist of this whole point here. Overfilling happiness bars is totally worth it. For one, it protects you from sudden occurrences like mass murder sprees and whatnot. The other hand, it gives you a nice protection from the ever-growing pressure from expectations. Don't worry, expectations grow really slow, but it is a factor that I feel like is really important to note, because otherwise you might fall into the trap of just fast-forwarding your city into death. Now, number five, I want to talk about the power of decorations and the environment. This is something that goes a long way. You have here decorations, and here you can build all manner of different things. The pillars and the statues need to be researched first, but the rest of these are all available right from the get-go. You can build up torches, they cost metal, that makes them relatively costly in a certain degree, but importing some metal and transforming it into lighting is really powerful, as no species can stomach the dark. Also, benches cost you only a little bit of furniture, place them down wherever you find a spot. It also increases the happiness of your city just for a little bit of resource. The other decorations are more situational and you need to check on out what your races in your city want. So for example, humans love awe, so everything made out of cut stone is really tickling their fancy. You also have a certain need for pillars, statues and even some trees. That's an interesting factor because one must know, humans don't gain benefits from the harmony the trees emit, but they want some trees to see and some trees to look at. The environment tab in general is a treasure trove of ways and means to increase the happiness of your city without investing new workers. That being said, it is very important that you check out how every species that you're playing with is wired, because boy have they different ideas of what's fun for them. So that being said, moving over to point number six, jobs. So every race has a couple of jobs they love and a couple of jobs they hate. So I think the best example for that are the Dondorians, as I find it so amusing to these guys. They are excellent miners, as you see depicted by these blue arrows, but the green bar above there shows you the happiness about this job. So a Dondorian is an excellent coal miner, but they freaking hate to do that. I mean, coal mining is one of the most uh, unfavorable jobs in the world, <laughs> humans hate it even more, but I just want to point out that jobs 
have an impact on the happiness of your city as well. And in a nutshell, if you want to keep certain fields of your city happy, you ideally distribute jobs so that nobody has to do jobs that they hate. As you can also see, everybody, that the standard fulfillment is 50%. That means everybody kind of hates their jobs, and being really happy with their job is a rare occurrence in this game. That being said, you can change this by going into the Occupation tab and change the work priorities there. Here you can change who is going to be on which priority for which job. By moving the slider, you can make the priority go up or down. So for example, to avoid our Dondorians to go in the farms where we don't want them, you could easily go and here exclude them, for example, from coal mining. So henceforth, no Dondorian citizen in your city would ever dare to go into coal mine. So this way you can it is an emergency tool in my personal book. Sometimes when a certain field of my city is super unhappy, I think like, yeah, let's unemploy the miners to get some happiness back. But eventually, yeah, I just wanted to point out that jobs have an impact on happiness and you can utilize this uh, gauge as well. So religion, I want to talk a little bit more about the things that you can do about religion. So first off, we've been already talking about the shrines. They have a relatively low base impact. To Im increase their impact, they need to be upgraded by the Worshipping with Style tech. Costs you 500 tech points, but is well worth the price, as it allows you to upgrade your shrines with it twice. So you not only get one upgrade uh, gauge, but two of them, which is really, really cool, and uh, gives you a really nice way to work around. Also, Religion covers proper burial, we have already covered that, as soon as you can get your hands on crypts, this is really, really amazing, but I want to talk here mostly about temples. So temples are where things get a little bit uh, difficult. So as you see here, religions don't like each other, and they oppose each other. So all in all, I'd strongly suggest you, therefore, to keep the opposition rate low as far as i know at least correct me if i do say something wrong here i only go for one side of the pantheon because otherwise you will have these opposing religions that hate each other and it lowers the whole happiness bar again the interesting part about temples is when temples are fully maintained and uh, geared with sacrifices that's an important point they not only get give out happiness they also boost industries as you see there there's a uh, bunch of things bound to each god. As you see here, the evil gods provide mostly submission things and warfare things, whereas the good gods are mostly production bonuses. They are relatively tiny, but you can do with religion a lot of wonderful things. But the bottom line is, beyond shrines and burial, temples are among the most costly things in the game to achieve, and it is not worth it aiming for them too early. Alone, these the 5,500 tech points to unlock these temples is a really huge thing. So, it is a late game tool, a really valuable one, because it really cranks out a lot of happiness, but at the end of the day, you have to check out what your people like, and some races, well, they will always be a little bit... Uh, unfulfilled towards your religious uh, ideas, whereas other um, species, like the Cretonians, well, they are okay if you only want to pull. That's that. Number eight, I want to talk about what you can do with food and clothing. Obviously, every race has a couple of food preferences, so that means if they can eat that stuff, they go happy. Very important caveat about that, if that food is not provided on a food stall or a restaurant, no happiness provided. So it's really important that you have these distributor buildings, in case you were wondering for what you'd need them besides for service fulfillment. That's what for. So that's one thing that you can do, but it doesn't end here. Food is, in general, a very powerful resource. We can allow our people to eat more, which will instantaneously make them happier, but you also will have to stem a much higher food production. It's a very interesting late game mechanic though, as you can technologically boost up your food industries to crazy points, and your empire can eventually also 
call in huge taxations of food, for example. So this way you can do something about that. It goes the same though for drinks. So as long as there is a drink ration uh, assigned, people will take drinks out of the warehouse and drink them directly. If you forbid that, or you try to forbid that, you see it doesn't work. So that is why I said taverns are currently a little bit of a noob trap, because you won't be getting any tavern fulfillment before the taverns have access to booze. A tavern without booze, no fulfillment. So therefore, drinks are a little bit complicated, but drinks always make the people happy. The other thing that you can always go for is clothing. As you can see here, clothing can also be assigned in several layers, and the more layers the people have, they are not only getting happier, they are also gaining heat and cold resistance. Stuff wears out, that means the more people you want to clothe extremely well, the more clothing industry you need, but that is something attainable. There's also jewelry, which is for every race. You see, everybody loves their bling, except for the uh, unhuman Argonash, but uh, they are uh, they are huge and like spidery things. They don't need bling. So, yeah, wonderful as they are, you know. In a nutshell, jewelry is therefore a really powerful thing, but mind you, it is deactivated by default. So jewelry got, does not go to the citizens by default. So you can absolutely use that to your own advantage if you are that wealthy to make lots of jewelry or buy it. Now, next thing on my list, housing. So as you can see here, housing can also get furniture. Furniture is something that you can apply into your houses. Just mind that there's a yearly consumption behind it, and that makes things gosh darn costly over time. So for example here, we have a yearly consumption of 1,066 pieces of wood a year. That is something you need to divide by 16, and yeah, it's quite a lot of wood per day. But it also ends in fancier housing. Also means that this is a very, very deep hole where you can put your resources into. Every race has different needs in that regard. Some live more fancy, some live more meager, but at the end of the day, very interesting gauge to turn or, uh, to play around with. But it doesn't end here. So housing can also be upgraded by building the houses out of materials that your people like. Every race has a preference in a certain aspect for a certain material building wise. So if you get to the point where you can make citizens uh, buildings out of cut stone for the humans, they'd be super happy about that. And it doesn't matter if you started out with wooden buildings, you can always go for the structures menu here, select the um, wall icon, and we go now for the grand building type and as you see here we can now just drag and drop these on two existing walls it'll get replaced just like that if claimable here that the, the problem with these is that it is unreachable so sometimes some things remain undoable but at the end of the day, replacing these things like that does already do a lot of the uh, environment bonus. What I'm trying to get down to here is use the housing's details to make your people happier. And at the end of the day, you can always manipulate who's living who with the assign tool. This allows you to go even one step further to build a part of the city appealing to a certain race, especially, and then house them there specifically. And last but not least, I want to talk about the noise walls, you know, most people, if you're not Crotonian or Dondorian, hate noise. Walls block noise. So if you ever have to build your houses in the vicinity of noisy places, build noise-canceling walls. It does not work in the modern times only. also works in the medieval times. It's amazing. All right. Last point on the list, number 10, hoarding. So every race out there has something they love to hoard. So... It's up to you to check out what that is. Here in the environment tab, you can see that, for example, humans love to hoard gems. So you get an innate bonus for just having gemstone. There's something else for everybody else. The Cretonians love to have rations on the, on the pile. These guys love their Scythalon. These guys love their meat. These guys love their fish. More meat lovers. You get it. The supernatural ones don't have any storage bonuses, but it doesn't exactly end there. There is also a riches meter. So 
money in your bank also makes people happy. That is also a very, very interesting and important uh, uh, metric. And last but not least, food in the bank also makes people happy. There is a certain satisfaction of people for having a certain amount of rations available. By the way, this meter and that meter are the same. So that means, oh, oh no, sorry, this one. <laughs> Uh, not the food rations one, the food days, the food days meter and that one are the same. So there is a limit, obviously, as you see, to just stockpiling and it is everywhere. But stockpiling is actually a legit technology or, or a lit strategy, a lit legit <laughs> strategy to go down for uh, to go down with if you want to make your city happier. So there's certainly a couple of more things that you can do. I... Uh, want to point out with the hoarding technology though it should always go hand in hand if you want to go with the, if you want to go for that strat do yourself a favor and research the oh, where is it at <laughs> no where is it again there's a spoilage technology that i keep missing oh, i'm sorry this tech tree gets reworked so often maintenance spoilage there it is in the architecture tab so if you want to rack up happiness by just hoarding stuff, check out that spoilage uh, tech, because some things just spoil gosh darn fast, especially if you have meat lovers or um, well, rations, they also have a pretty decent spoilage. The only things that don't spoil too fast are gemstones and cephalon. The other materials that people love to store, they suffer from degradation. Therefore, that's one thing where which you can use to alleviate that. So. Yeah, that's that. I hope you found that interesting. I hope there were a few things in between that you didn't know yet. And feel free to leave your personal tips and tricks to that topic down there in the comment section so people can get even smarter from just reading the comment tab. I always love that. So feel free to leave a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Check out the description box leading to entire playlists of Songs of Six info content. And of course, if you'd be so kind, there's also stuff to support the channel. So big, big thanks to all of you who do. And a big, big thanks to you watching this video up until the very end. This also is a wonderful way of supporting the channel. I want to say thanks for being around and see you all next time.